okay. So uh, happy the way these look here. I think it's it's a beautiful installation. Um, now, was that your no uh, recommendation that I might follow? It, it was not. I think well, that was. Well, I want to tell um, you that is a wonderful brand new to the end of yes, the year. Yes, yes, that was uh, Jennifer. Okay. Uh, Jennifer's decision, I gather, um, based on Mark Rothko's preferences. Mm. He. Um, at various points, talked to curators about how he wanted his works displayed, and uh, he liked them low, and he also liked them not uh, overly lit, um, which is also true here, I think. You know, well, not, there's not a light on it. <laughs> it's not flooded with light, and um, you know, but I think I think. Um, one wouldn't want them too much lower <laughs> because they're small paintings. Obviously, a large painting can go can go lower. Um, and he also liked people to get up close to the paintings, um, and so I would encourage that, um, and maybe even closer than with a big painting, because um, once he said, "I paint big because I want intimacy," which is kind of paradoxical, you know, but he wanted the feeling that the painting would, would um, relate to you and sort of envelop you. Um, and uh, Barnett Newman, uh, one of his colleagues, uh, felt the same way. Um, so we have, you know, hundreds of Rothko paintings at the National Gallery uh, because um, the estate was settled. There were lawsuits and uh, malfeasance and all kinds of things. There's a whole book about that called <laughs> The Legacy of Mark Rothko. Um, but his, his two children um, sued uh, the executors in Marlboro Gallery who were mishandling the estate and it was settled and, and a lot of the works went to museums, um, mostly the National Gallery. So we, we have had a mission since 1986 when we got those works to lend them. So when Todd asked me for a Rothko painting, I said, take two. <laughs> um, yes. Was, was the uh, contention, contention between the children because they wanted to keep the stuff, or? No, it was um, that the Marlboro Gallery and the three executors, um, one, of whom, one of whom was, was uh, Theodore Stamos, the painter who was here in, in another gallery, um, they were um, selling the works very quickly at low prices in order to make a quick profit, and that's not um, a proper way to manage an estate, of course, and there was also some, some other um, shenanigans, um, and so uh, that, was, that was the, the problem. But a lot of the works were retrieved, and, and a lot of them uh, did end up with the family, with the two children, um, but about half were given to museums you know, as a part of the settlement, and you know there were tax reasons to do that as well. Um, but anyway, we're here to look at the paintings. <laughs> were they meant to be under glass like this? That would have been yes, um, I'm sorry about that, but when we lend uh, works out, we almost always you know, want them to be under glass. We've had bad experiences with Rothko's um, and other paintings um, in other museums, or in our museum too, because um, the surfaces are very delicate. And, um, you know, every once in a while, if a, a visitor, often a small visitor, will just <laughs> get to a painting What's before it burns and stop. <laughs> yeah, it, it, does, it, it doesn't, it's not because of preserving the color, because there were some issues with telling this color that um, that's, that's right, there's been issues of fading of his paint, um, but that's not the reason here. Uh, he, he's, this amount of light is not going to save the paintings. And um, they're both under, under glass, under, under plexi. Um, that one is, 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 is under a better plexi, actually. <laughs> and I, I was talking to Todd about this, and, and I think we're going to try to change out this plexi for the um, non-reflective plexi, which doesn't have the uh, reflections and the, the waviness, so I'm sorry about that. We'll, we'll see if we can do that. 
Um, so how do you all, uh, this, this is a whole gallery of abstract art, obviously, and that can be challenging, uh, right, for, for, for everybody, um, for visitors uh, who might not know a lot about it. So I'm curious, um, I'll tell you how I, how I would approach this, but how, how, how have you been approaching um, abstraction? <laughs> color and images. Okay. Of the painting. Mm -hmm. Tons of color in this room. Shapes and yeah. sizes. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and what is the, the juxtaposition of color, how it affects you? Yes. Um, emotionally. Right, right. You were saying? And for younger uh, visitors, we let them use their imagination and tell us what they think it's about. And right, right, absolutely. Um, or, or some adjectives that come to mind mm -hmm. when they see the, the slide. Right, right. And it's interesting that the two Rothkos here are flanked by these two really powerful uh, action painting uh, women of abstract mm -hmm. expressionism. And I think it's great because that's, that's one side of the movement, and right? The, and then this is the other side. Um, so it's a wonderful contrast. And I think that, that in itself can be a great point of, of discussion, really the two Alternatives. I mean, it's a little bit oversimplified, but within abstract expressions, it'd be action painters like um, Pollock, uh, de Kooning, Hardigan. When I say de Kooning, I should say Bill de Kooning and Elaine de Kooning. Um, versus the uh, much more quiet uh, painters, so to speak. Uh, Frankenthaler. Who else uh, comes to mind? Rothko, obviously. Morris Lewis. Morris Lewis, Lewis, right. And Morris Lewis was, was interestingly, um, the same age as Rothko, but he, he's associated with, with that generation over there because he didn't start painting until, um, you know, he was, he was um, you know, in his, in his 40 or so. So he, he's part of the um, sort of second, second wave. Barnett Newman, um, Clifford Still, um, those are the painters who applied the paint in a, in a much, um, you know, less dynamic way. Um, but they all, you know, shared a lot of the same goals, I think, which had to do with, as you were saying, feeling. A lot of them did. It's interesting. We talk about these in terms of form and shape and color. Um, Mark Rothko did not want to hear about that. He, he really disliked uh, formal analysis of his paintings. He said they are not, um, of course there is form and shape and color, but uh, for him, um, the important thing was the feeling that they, they evoked and uh, the subject matter. He even talked about subject matter, if you can believe it, <laughs> in relation to these paintings. Um, so that is, that is, a, is an interesting question. How can paintings like this have a subject, and um, what he said was that um, the subjects are the basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, and doom. He was a dark <laughs> kind of personality. Um, and he also said the only subject matter that counts is subject matter that is tragic and timeless. So. That's not the subject in the way we usually think of it. He's, he's really talking about um, very basic kinds of uh, powerful uh, responses. But he he said there, there's no good painting that, that is just painting of, of nothing. Um, and, and that's true of all the abstract expressionists, I think. They, they, um, they rejected people like uh, Mondrian. Mm -hmm. um, they thought Mondrian was just doing design. Just attractive design. I, I actually don't agree with that, but for them, um, you know, and this is this is the um, during World War II, you know, and uh, terrible times. Um, Rothko is Jewish, of course. Um, you know, he's learning about the Holocaust, uh, so is Barnett Newman, and so there was a feeling. I think you could say throughout the art world, certainly throughout the uh, New York uh, art world, that. Um, painting had to start over. Uh, Barnett Newman said, you know, what are we going to paint? 
what are we going to paint? We can't paint what has been painted. Um, because we see where that sort of the culture of that it led to uh, world destruction. Um, feeling of starting over and um, getting rid of all of the tried and true techniques, Renaissance, perspective, narrative, um, and modeling, shading, you know, <laughs> representation, all of those things. Um, so the problem was uh, for an American artist or a, you know, a, a naturalized American rock goes from Latvia, born in 1903, emig Jewish emigre to the US, um, but they wanted to be American painters. They didn't want to be European painters. That, that was associated with, with the old masters, really. Um, but they also didn't want to be provincial <laughs> and sort of backwards, right? So they had to uh, develop something uh, new. Um, and and this, this was actually, this kind of conversation was happening before these paintings. So th these are 1949 and 1951. But Going back to 1940, um, Rothko uh, was, and that's partly what this, this whole uh, catalog is, is about, which I don't know if you've seen this, um, but I recommend this. And this is something, this is in a way why these paintings are here, because um, about 10 years ago, uh, Todd called me and said I want to do a Rothko show. He was at the uh, Columbia Museum in South Carolina. And uh, he came to the right place. We, we do Rothko shows. We learned Rothko. So, um, and what he wanted to do, I was so happy to, to learn, was not a big retrospective, but a focus show. So focusing on one decade, which is the 1940s, which is the de key decade where he moved from surrealism and from um, an interest in um, ancient Greek tragedy and um, architecture as subjects to this. He, he then got here to the 1940s. So, um, and so uh, Todd and I had, had a connection and, um, and you know, we're, we're keeping that going. Um, so uh, I'll show you a few, a few things about, you know, where, what happened before this and especially with this painting, I think. So, my, my sense is, you know, you have two paintings here, right? And you could deal with them uh, individually, as I think is important and one should, right? Um, but also, they um, create a, a chronology, really. Um, a, cla a classic kind of slide comparison for any Rothko course, because this is um, kind of just before he really becomes Rothko, right? He's sort of quivering on the brink of being <laughs> the Rothko that we know, right? So I think that, um, in addition to looking at the paintings individually, that, you know, it's, it's irresistible to compare them, right? And to, to, to think what, what, is, what is the same and what is, what is different. Um, might even be interesting to ask um, before visitors necessarily read the labels, which one came first, you know? Um, I mean, we all know that because we know that um, Rothko ended up doing those, those classic uh, paintings with, with the stacked, the very simple stacked rectangles. Um, and um, some people might think this, this one is more advanced because it's more complex, you know, and there's more going on. But for Rothko, he wanted to get to less complex, I think. Um, so, so, um, You know, I think that would be that would certainly be a good exercise to talk about um, similarities and differences. Obviously, there's a lot of similarities in, in, in the, um, the, the the handling of paint, the soft edges, and the close uh, color uh, values. Um, but uh, but there's so many differences too. Uh, so so this painting for me, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into this a little more. So I, I'm giving a lecture tonight. Um, that suggests, you, you were talking about, you know, imagination. What, what does it suggest? That would be a good question here, I think. What, what, 
do you get in terms of suggestions, um, if any, from that page? It's a closed door. A closed door. It's a black door. And, and so did whoever wrote this wall label. I don't know if you've read this yet, but there's a quote. Um, My pictures are indeed facades, as they have been called. Sometimes I open one door and one window, or two doors and two windows. I do this only through shrewdness. There is more power in telling a little than in telling all. <laughs> so, um, Yes, doorways, case, then, windows. The light, the light the rectangle is the open door and the dark the rectangle is the I, I, I think that's, that's very um, interesting. Yeah, and I'm not going to say anything is right or wrong because <laughs> you know, we're not in that business, right? <laughs> that's not what we're, not what we're doing. What else? Two people. Two right. people. Mm -hmm. that, that's sort of my association, um, two people. Uh, maybe just because they're these two vertical columns, right? And this one in particular seems to have head and, and, and body, although, you know, that, and there seems to be a real, I mean, I think the, the, the sort of uh, meat of this painting is right, what happens right in between, you know, where there's this uh, lovely, a whole set of, of the strokes of, of different colors, and then, the, you know, one down here, and then here, that, tension between, between these two columns. Um, what else? Well, I just said the word columns, and that's another thing that I get, and going back to doorways, you know, sense of architecture of one thing um, on top of another. Uh, and we know that, um, you know, columns in Greek architecture, they have capitals, right? Mm -hmm. They have um, faces and you know, they are related to the figure, of course. Did you have a, a question? Yeah, sure. I kind of see like, the person on the left side leaning on a column with a landscape in the background on the right side, whether it be a sea or a mountain. So this... And then a sunset above it. You, you, so. You're going, you're going for it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, um, yeah, which, which island are we on? <laughs> uh, maybe we can <laughs> okay, yeah, perfect. So the, the figure here and the landscape here? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So you kind of have like the subtle, you kind of have like an implication of a mountain right there with, with how the stroke works at the top of that bluer piece on the bluer piece. Is there a right? Oh, here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, kind of stuff like the yeah. silhouette. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. top of the one, right? Yeah. So, and that's one thing about abstraction, which is so much fun, right? Is that we're almost wired to to want to see things, you know? That's almost like a survival instinct, you know. I'm sure it's it's evolutionary. We we are always looking for picking out the figures against the ground, whatever is going to move across our field of vision, maybe threaten us or or what have you. So we're um, we're we're wired to do that, and I think it's great to do that. Um, and then I think it's also great for us educators to push back a little bit against that too. And I mean, and that happens once you realize there are all these different competing interpretations. Well, you know, it, it really sends you back to kind of um, the paint uh, on the canvas and the shapes and forms that you that you deal with. Um, so, does Rothko, does Rothko define his work that way? Or is what he, way? <laughs> you know, I mean, does he want you to organize it, or is he just okay. wanting you to absorb it? And he wants you to cry. <laughs> he wants you to cry. So. He said that's the best reaction. People who cry in front of my paintings, they are getting it. Um, he doesn't want, and this is, you know, we don't have to obey him, but he, he doesn't want a formal analysis. Um, he doesn't want you to count the shapes or, you know, obsess about all of that. It's this emotional response. Um, but of course, he is dealing with forms and colors, and that's how he gets the response, you know. Um, but he, he very much um, wanted this um, deep kind of meditative relationship, and I think that's one reason he moves from this kind of painting to that kind of painting, because this is really like a target of meditation. Um, I mean, there are kinds of meditation where you just like 
focus on one thing, right? And you're not getting distracted by a lot of things, a lot of possible narratives, tensions, um, associations. It's harder to have those here. There's just not as much going on. I mean, people see sunsets here, and that's, you know, the New Yorker cartoon of, you know, someone looking out at the sunset and saying, I, you know, I saw that rock, I went to Guggenheim or something. <laughs> um, but there is a lot less here. There's nothing to focus on. Everything is soft and simple, and you focus on the whole thing. Um, and the colors work on you. And, you know, we can certainly uh, think about his choices, you know. Um, I mean, why this form, he's darkened and it kind of stands out on the yellow ground, whereas this one, it's yellow on yellow, right? And there's always kind of rectangles with a, with a larger field. So it's yellow, and in fact, this one is maybe a little lighter than the surround, right? Um, and uh, I think that, and, and there's, he, he, he really fussed over these, and especially the edges, um, and uh, carefully feathering uh, to, I think, create um, dimension space, you know? It's not measurable space, but it's more this meditative space that you feel can, you know, maybe accommodate some of the tension. Um, this seems to sink back in a little bit. This, comes out, but everything is looming, and um, same, same here, I would say. You know, you really don't see many brush strokes in either painting, because brush strokes will, in his, I, I think in his world, be uh, distracting from the whole, and he's just kind of conjuring the painting, you know, out of what? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the only brush stroke I really see here is, is, is down here, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it's a sense of forms emerging almost almost naturally that um, I think he wanted. And, um, so, yeah. Are the yellows in, the, in, in this particular painting are just so well incorporated in this shade of that, you know, yeah. at, at, the, at the yellows and then the orange is sort of more solid as far as the dark. This is the magical part, I think, here. <laughs> and it's done with, with layering and veils. He talked about veiling and unveiling. Um, so there are many layers here. And I think um, underneath this, um, there's a darker tone underneath that, I think. What, one example, and, and a few places in his book, um, I think he learned um, a lot about this by working on paper with, with watercolor. So this is from 1949, same as the earlier painting here, but, but it's, he's really getting somewhere here in terms of um, the rectangles and the veils. So if you look at that lower one, he has layered a kind of ochre, I guess, on top of that blue. And, uh, but it's not opaque, so the blue shows through, and the result is a color that what is that color? <laughs> mud, <laughs> mud um, earth. He talked about earth a lot, mm -hmm. and um, just um, kind of the elements. I mean, you know. So um, what he and, and in a way that was easier with watercolor on paper. It's it's flowing. It's it's um, it's uh, less opaque. It's thinner, and he and he found ways then to do that in in paint. Um, so that, that idea of, of veiling and layering is very important. Getting back to this one, I, okay, so we were talking about various associations, figures, columns. So um, this is a painting from uh, 1941 to 1942. Um, and uh, this goes back to that time I was talking about where he's, he's trying to find a, a new subject, you know. And um, he and his friend Adolf Gottlieb decide to, to work on a Greek tragedy. Uh, Sophocles, Aeschylus, um, and so this is um, a three, a kind of three-headed uh, prophet figure, <laughs> um, uh, with a sense of classical architecture and columns, um, and uh, 
what's the name of this? This one have a name, this one is untitled, but there are others in the Oedipus and things like that. So, um, so for anyone who's used columns, you can go back here and you see the organization is, is, is very much the same in terms of, of uh, vertical um, kind of, here's another, another one. Um, Omen of the Eagle, where there's um, a sense of the oracle and birds and feathers and uh, prophecy. Um, and he's already starting to develop the, um, the rectangular structure behind the subject without really knowing that that's what he will, um, he will end up with. Um, are those of similar scale? Or they yes, they are. Yeah. They are very much. Um, he also um, painted in the in the New York uh, or the Brooklyn subway system, and here the figures are associated. Um, these these emaciated <coughs> figures underground, associated with the columns, um, you know, holding up the, uh, the subway, um, and that I think has to do um, partly with the T. S. Eliot poems, which he loved, and the wasteland, where there's that passage, that dark, 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 we all go into the dark there in London, it's during the Blitz. Um, there's a, that sense of tragedy, whether it's back in ancient times or, you know, uh, in the present. Um, so he goes through that, um, and then he gets interested in surrealism and um, biomorphic forms. Uh, visiting the Museum of Natural History, looking at things under under a microscope, how uh, how life uh, evolves. So, um, you know, a painting like a painting like this, um, or this. I'm, I'm looking at this vertical one just because it again has that sense of vertical um, columns and figures, but but also you know uh, sea life tendrils, uh, jellyfish, uh, amoebas, whatever you want. There, there's a famous painting at the moment called um, Slow Swirl by the Edge of the Sea. So an idea of life emerging from a kind of primordial soup, which was a popular theory of, of evolution. Um, and so that, that kind of thing, oops, <laughs> is, um, should never put post-its on a book, right? That sticky stuff. <laughs> I'm taking them off. <laughs> um, so, you know, not that you're going to necessarily do this, you know, you know, here in the gallery, but but just so you know, there there are those layers uh, behind this of associations um, that he he works through and gradually, uh, for better or worse, you know, some people would say for worse, but for better or worse, he wants to get beyond any of those specific references and um, to get to something more pure, uh, direct. So he's almost there here, but not quite. And then he uh, arguably gets there um, with his classic format, which he then sticks with, really, with plenty of variations um, for, uh, for the rest of his life. How many years did he stay in one period? Really, he, um, I mean, he went through a bunch of periods in, um, in his earlier work. Um, so in the 1920s, doing landscapes, interested in Cezanne. In the 30s, he was very, very influenced by Milton Avery. He studied with Milton Avery, sat at Milton Avery's feet, and uh, I know we have an example of that in here. Um, and he had to, kind of free himself of, of that powerful uh, influence um, here. Uh, Milton Avery on, on the uh, right, and early Mark Rothko on the left. So in a very a kind of um, chunky, expressive approach to the figure. Um, these, are, these are folks having a picnic. <laughs> the left, or Avery, a cellist on the right, but I think you can see there's that um, kind of uh, everything, the, the handling, the color, the scraping, the, the uh, 
kind of um, silhouettes uh, that are kind of um, uh, chunky, clunky. Um, it's almost Gauguin-ish. Gauguin, mm -hmm. I think very much, and there's a sense of a primitive quote-unquote mm -hmm. fantasy, um, uh, the figure in the landscape. Um, so we had to work through Milton Avery, and, um, and then we had to, or wanted to work through um, surrealism. And you know, there's a, a painting by um, Charles Seliger over there, is, 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 could be almost a Rothko, you know, um, looking at these, um, where Barnett Newman, they, they were looking at, at, at these forms, uh, biomorphic forms, as we say, things that seem like life, but we can't really pinpoint them. Um, and um, yeah, and, and so those are a lot of uh, sort of quicker periods that he goes through. But then when he, you know, like a lot of a lot of these artists, they of this era, they hit they hit something, and then they were happy, <laughs> and they found um, really their their signature. For Pollock, it was the drift, you know. For um, Franz Klein, it was the big black and white stroke. Um, and for Rothko, it was the, the uh, rectangular format. Um, very simple. Hundreds of variations, of course. You can have two rectangles, three, four. They can be smaller or bigger. They can be softer or harder. They can be warm and cool. They can have more colors or less colors. Um, one of my uh, favorites is, uh, let's see. Um, no, it's in here because I don't want it to show. This one, um, which is just gorgeous, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, this is actually one of the first of the classic paintings. And I mean, look at the range of colors, right? Purples, greens, blacks, oranges, yellows, whites. Um, and that's 1949. So um, just a little bit, probably later than this painting, within that year, <laughs> because he's, he's gotten to his format. Um, and I love this, but I think um, he decided, I know that he decided to uh, limit the palette. It's almost like there was too much going on here, too rich. Also, he had um, seen a Pierre Bonnard show at the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, th these are very Bonnard, French, Mediterranean colors, you know, just gorgeous, warm, cool, um, most uh, kind of like an oriental carpet, just rich glowing colors. And I think, uh, I love it, but I think he, he found it a little too much. And then he, he so he sort of brought the palette uh, under more control. Um, but basically from, from, from this painting on, 1949, he's got his format and he keeps it until, until his death in 1970. So that's 20 years of painting soft rectangles. <laughs> one on top of the other. Yeah. Did he talk yes. about the horizontal? Why the horizontal was not that more I effective know of. maybe than the vertical? Not, not that I know of. And I think, you know, a lot of that nitty gritty he, he, he will not discuss. And he, he wouldn't discuss and he leaves it up to us. But I think it is, um, it's very interesting and noteworthy that almost all the paintings are a vertical format and the rectangles within them are often horizontal um, or square, I guess, in this case, down here. And why, why, that's a good thing to wonder about. He doesn't tell us. Why, why do you think he, he's doing that? There are a few exceptions, but. Uh, maybe, maybe have something to do with the height, the fact that he wanted them well, I think that, that has something to do with it, and, um, and our height, too, you know, and, and that relationship to the viewer. Remember, he was talking about doorways, talking about um, that intimacy that I said earlier, where he wants us to, um, you know, be close to the paintings and have them envelop us. So there's almost a, it could be a vestige of that, that human presence, you know, mm -hmm. the verticality. Because they're, he's a humanist, and he wants the paintings to uh, relate to us, and, and vice versa. Um, 
Yes, they, their, their proportions are, are very important. Um, I, I don't think he's working out at all. It's all very intuitive. I mean, often people try to find a you know golden section or ratio or something. Don't think that's going on with Rocco, but um, but yeah, well, I don't know. Like so. if we we think about some artists do think yeah. about that golden triangle, and when I think yeah. just intuitively, that's. A Amazing yes. relationship. Yes, there is something uh, very satisfying about that. The, those, those two shapes seem to be the right sizes and shapes. <laughs> 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 um, he did, uh, you know, later in his career, he, he explored uh, more of a half and half um, with, a, with a sharper division. And it, they're, they're quite different. Um, and uh, his own. Sort of encourage the same, I think, uh, meditative uh, approach. When you do get close to this, and I, I, I would encourage that too, you, you begin to see, um, you know, some some of the uh, tricks. I guess um, this uh, field is all is brushed vertically. I think the final layer is vertical. I think you can, you can see that a little bit even from there. These striations. This field is very much brushed uh, horizontally. Um, so there's another very subtle, you know, level of contrast. Um, there's also, Todd and I were talking about this, there's all kinds of speckles of, of, a, of a lighter paint on the surface. And um, that is uh, very likely just studio accident. Um, and he was not um, fussy about that. You, you often see uh, brush hairs uh, in the paintings because he liked very loose uh, brushes. And I think he he might have been priming another canvas and it's spattering and you know, but it, it worked, I guess, for him as, as just another uh, part of the texture. Um, one thing about this painting that is, is a little hidden by the frame, but this as a rectangle, this is totally uh, skewed. He did not square it up well. So if you look down here, you'll see how close that is to the frame, and then it comes up here like that. Same thing on the top. I mean, when you make your stretch, you're supposed to just put it in a door frame or use a T-square or something. <laughs> he apparently forgot about that. And um, well, he started out that way, and then he started out that way, and it was too late. Uh, but um, you know, it's uh, within the frame, is that the frame actually helps. Uh, Helps that when, when I, I was putting my slides over here, and I thought, oh my gosh, can't don't we have a better, this photograph is taken in an angle. Don't we have a better photograph? It wasn't taken in an angle. It all features that, that in an angle. Um, and, and his yes. intent though originally was to display without a frame, right? Just a stretch hand. Yes, so. absolutely. And even um, that, and that that is important to say, I think. Um, you know. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that the, these frames are very nice that they go away, they sort of go away, mm -hmm. and um, the, the more fluid frames you can have. But yes, he, he, um, he would do things to the edges to tr try to like clean them up sometimes, um, because the edges, you know, with no frame, the edges become important. Um, but uh, yeah, no frame, just like, you know, polish, no frames. Um, and, uh, and that goes along, you know, that's what we're talking about too. It goes along with, with, with modernism, right? I mean, we don't see too many frames here. The old, you know, the tray frame, the strip frame, you know, artists might like nail a piece of wood lab just to the edge. Um, no frames, I, w I would put in the same category as uh, no titles, mm -hmm. you know, or no pedestals for, for sculpture. I mean, that Anne Truitt really, um, shouldn't be on a pedestal, but we all put them on pedestals because they look good and it protects them a little bit. So, um, and I would, I would go with like no subject matter. You know, all of those things that um, are around art, <laughs> you know, that uh, they, they want to get rid of, so we're just left with, um, with the art. And, and that's such, such an important part of, of, all of all of the painters in here, um, you know really in the 20th century. 
So he never had any interpretive titles. I guess it was all like just number one, two, or up top. Pretty much from here on. You know, before that, he's okay with sacrificial moment or eyes of edifice or you know slow gentle slow swirl by the edge of the sea. But once he gets here, it's no uh, no coincidence. I think that as he gets rid of subject matter, he gets rid of titles. And I'm not sure when he got rid of frames, but um, that might have been a little bit a little bit earlier. Um, a title does influence your interpretation. It really does. It really does. Um, when you look at it without it, the, the title, and then yeah. you review the title, and say, yeah. wait a second. Right. He did title one. He did give one classic painting a title, and he called it For Matisse, which is telling, because when we're talking about color, uh, Matisse is way up there. And um, one of his uh, favorite paintings, which came to the Museum of Modern Art in 1949, back when he's, you know, having his breakthrough was uh, The Red Studio by Matisse. If you know that one, it's, it's not a huge painting, but it's all red, and it's Matisse's view of a studio, and then he's kind of scratched into the red to show, you know, the sculpture, painting, the easel, and so on. But it's, uh, for Rothkoe, it was the sort of demonstration that color alone could carry a work of art, even just a single color. Um, so, uh, or maybe two colors, <laughs> you know, in that case. So, uh, yeah, what else? <laughs> you mentioned his, uh, some of the later work where it's like a solid canvas with a line down the center, which is yes. one of the ones I typically think about with him. So, to me, that doesn't evoke the same kind of emotional responses these do because there's a lot there's a lot less going on it's yes. like one color with a line through the middle right. so can you give me why your, why yeah, you your take yeah. on that um my take is you know and there's no evidence for this <laughs> but <laughs> my take is that you know, maybe he began to feel that um, these techniques for getting to that transcendent meditative place were has got a little too easy for him. The soft focus, you know, that of course that encourages this entry in this kind of kind of uh, dispersal of our attention. Um, and, and modernists. You know, they, they, they hate to uh, uh, rest on their laurels. They're always looking for a, a challenge and they don't want things to get easy or, 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 or gimmicky. And I think that, um, well, I think that might have been part of it. So maybe, can I do this without the soft focus, with just the two colors? What, and, what period of his life are those? those very things? late, so. So, so he's getting well, near his doom state. He is, that's so, another interpretation, the black and gray, the brown and gray paintings. Um, that dark lines with Things get very dark, and they also are sharper on, on the edges. Violent, you violent. can go that way. I, I tend not to, because he also was doing some pastels towards the end of his life. And his last painting, um, I don't have them there, was a um, intense red, sort of all saturated red, maybe thinking back to the red studio. Um, but, uh, what was I going to say about that? Um, what were we talking about? The, uh, the hard the dark line. Yeah. Um, He's doing pastels at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, we'll come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's the one I typically think of that bright red with the black line down the middle mm -hmm. of it. It's like, yeah. I've stood there and gone, so what does this even mean? Why is, you know, right. that's the hardest for me. Right. Um, you know, the other thing I don't remember what I was going to say is that with these, with these paintings, he became very successful. Um, say from 1953 on, he had a real market. And later in the 50s, everyone on um, Fifth Avenue, you know, wanted one of those over their sofa. They were beautiful. And um, of course, that was good for him. And he moved uptown too, <laughs> you know. But at the same time, he hated it. 
because he was becoming a decorator for rich people. And it wasn't about tragedy and ecstasy and doom Sofa anymore. Art. <laughs> it was sofa art. Sofa art, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And uh, you can imagine how that made him feel. And in fact, there's the famous uh, story of the Four Seasons, the Seagram murals, where he was commissioned to decorate that very deluxe restaurant. And he, he really went at it. And I don't know if you saw the play Red by John Logan about some years ago now, which is all about that commission. You know, he poured himself into it, and then he decided he did not want to be um, a decorator for, for wealthy, the wealthy SOBs, as he said. <laughs> he wanted to give them indigestion. And, uh, and he realized you know, these paintings weren't going to do that. But those, the paintings he did for the Four Seasons are very, very dark, very dark forms. And, and, um, and, and uh, he, he had been a couple of other commissions for um, whole spaces. And that, in a way, that's also an important part of the late career where he's able to get commissions and to create a whole space. I mean, if you're talking about like entering the work and being meditative, that's the best way to do it, right? Not that just one, I mean, two paintings is a lot better than one, but a whole room. So the chapel in, in yes. Houston um, is amazing. And um, the Harvard murals, which uh, I used to be a curator of, unfortunately they faded mm -hmm. uh, terribly change color and they're not really exhibitable. Um, so at the Phillips Collection in Washington, there's a little room mm -hmm. which is really worth seeing and sitting on the bench because while he didn't paint those for that room, he approved the curation of that room and he and that bench is the bench that he sat on. So if you go to the Phillips and you sit on that bench, you're sitting, sitting on this bench, yeah. Yes. I was just going to say that I saw the, the major show at the gallery. I think it might have been in the 90s. 98, I think. Is, uh, but yeah. it went overwhelming. Yeah. There was so many. By yeah. the time you got out, it was good eyes. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. I saw that show at the Whitney, actually. Um, same show. And I remember that there was also a Pollock retrospective uh, at MoMA at the same time. And I, it was quite a moment going back and forth. And I thought, I mean, I love Pollock, and I thought um, Pollock's going to be the winner for me. And I ended up liking the Roth show more. Um, and I'm not sure why, but uh, it, seeing a lot of them together, you know, either it's too much or it's completely sort of um, immersive. You know. Well, did he, did he engage with the other? Oh yes, very much. So he was um, he was closest to um, Adolf Gottlieb, whom I mentioned, um, Barnett Newman, Clifford Still, um, and um, not as close to Pollock and, and uh, de Kooning. Um, but he had a falling out with Newman. I think it had to do with probably their different levels of success mm -hmm. and when he moved uptown and you know <laughs> so um, they were none of them easy to get along with <laughs> it's kind of amazing they, they got along at all with each other um, and I've gotten to know um, his children uh, Christopher and Kate and um, Christopher Rothko is very involved with, with um, his father's work. He's they, they still have a lot of artwork. He's been involved with the recent uh, renovation of the chapel in Houston, and new treatment of light and the skylight and, and the ground. Um, he's written about it, even though he, he was very small when his when his father killed himself. Um, he became a, a, a psychotherapist, and then, <laughs> maybe not surprisingly, um, but then he he retired into um, working with the art. So um, it's, um, you know, speaking with them at site, I kind of feel like I, I have a little, a little uh, sort of window into, into the Rothko. In, in your experience, Harry, with these, with these works, yeah. and I guess all the others in the National Gallery, any, uh, any visitor experiences that stand out? seen visitors or work or engaged visitors in front of them? Um, well, I think 
the, the, the highlight for me was that um, I happened to be on the job when the East Building closed for three years for renovations, and then we reopened in 2016. And so I was able to reinstall the whole building. And we had two, um, two or three new spaces, towers, that we um, that were always there, but we developed into galleries, kind of like your fifth floor here. Um, and um, and I, hung a, a, I got to hang a Rothko room there, which is still there, um, right next to a Barnett Newman room. Um, and um, the Barnett Newman room is in Stations of the Cross, very spare uh, black and white uh, paintings. And the Rothko room is just, uh, you know, an explosion of color. Mm. And, um, and it's been interesting to see the reactions of, of people. And, um, um, and, and, and people tend to, in the, in the Newman room, they get very meditative and um, quiet and it's very peaceful. Also, it's, it is in some way the Stations of the Cross, so we actually have, have um, groups come at Easter to, to sort of be with those paintings. Um, and then they were Jewish, um, but very interested in all kinds of spirituality. And, but then moving into the rock room, that people do cry because it is, it's, I think, you know, it's the painting, it's also like, oh my God, there, there's, there's so many Rothkos here, and uh, I know how much they're worth, and am I actually in the presence of all the others, that kind of thing, is the aura, which you have to try to kind of separate from the emotion of, um, you know, just having that, that um, privilege, you know, of, of so many uh, Rothkos, so. But as I said, we, we love to send them out, you know, on the road. And I think um, they, they seem very happy here. I also I do love the Anne Truitt uh, in connection with them. And I, I would actually, in terms of a, a looking at the whole room, I think, I mean, and, uh, Jennifer put that on, on axis here, you know, right here. It's filling this, this space here. And um, it looks, you know, just like a, Monolith, whatever monolith, but she was a painter. She said that's really a painting in three dimensions. It's a little hard to see because lighting is always hard, but it, it's very delicate. Well, paint there, color. It's not black, right? It's a right. very deep blue. That's, and, that's, uh, an that's an excellent piece to talk to people about because they say, now why is that in a museum? Because right. it's so, it looks so simplistic. Right. So, and then you can bring and them then anywhere. just bring them close and say, okay, tell me what you see, yes. and walk around it and see what the color yes. suddenly changes from, right. you know, from floor to ceiling. Right, right. So I said, we just talked 15 minutes, and that's something we can do. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. That, that is such a good, that's such a good lesson. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you. I think I've worn you out. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this has got us a lot to think about. Yeah. We're also doing um, some of the Mm. Um, you know, our intent is in a, in a similar yes. scenario. Like, yeah, really do some meditative looking. That is, this is great. How, how do you uh, run that? Do you have a, a plan for that? Or? Yeah, I actually want to do one. So we're open Wednesday nights. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, so uh, this month, actually, the 27th, we, we've chosen a Wednesday. And it's a pre registered event. That way we know how many schools to have at home. And it, it's a combination of sort of centering and breathing. Mm -hmm. And, and looking, yeah, and then yeah. and then we'll take some time and unpack, to, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just like we did with making associations, yeah, emotions that come up, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think that could work with um, with Gene Davis too, in a yeah, totally well, different register, that, yeah. you know, because there, that works on you, I think, uh, in some yeah, similar the ways. Yeah, the and the receding kind yeah, of stuff. Right. Well, oh, thank you yeah. for, uh, I had noticed. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.